We continue our discussion of the overwhelming evidence for a global flood in response to the absurd anti-creationist claims that there is no such evidence, and we address several viewer questions about sloth migration after they get off Noah's Ark. This is Genesis Week. And welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the origins controversy, proudly brought to you by the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education. Excellence in pirate broadcasting, we continue to bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear, and we give glory to our creator while we do it. It is currently November 10th of the year 2023. Because we are recording these sh original shows live, I'm going to try to put the date in the shows for future reference. We're going to pick up and continue where we left off last week with our previously recorded live show with my awesome co-host, Hal Vashaw. We were addressing the ludicrous claim by multiple anti-creationists who were boldly proclaiming that there was absolutely no evidence for a global flood. As you saw when we started discussing the topic, there is actually so much evidence that it's difficult to know where to begin. We had to cut the show into multiple shows because we had already consumed the entire airtime, only getting part way down my list. <laughs> We left off with what are called planation surfaces, sometimes entire mountain ranges whose tops have been planed off by fast moving water, seeking its own level, hundreds to thousands of meters above present day sea level. Case in point, the entire Eastern seaboard of Canada. But, this phenomenon is truly global, indicative of a global flooding event, as is even seen in Antarctica. So let's take a trip out to the Canadian Midwest. This is Cypress Hills Interprovincial Park on the border of Saskatchewan and Alberta. And I conducted a whole mess of study here um, because as you can see, it it's, it's a planation surface. You're on top of a small mountain. And as you can see, it's flat all around. Just do a 360 degree turn. But if you go down the sides, uh, for instance, uh, Highway 41, where the highway follows the edges, you'll notice the mountain is actually composed of all these rounded river rocks. And these rocks are almost are all almost all made of a very hard rock called quartzite. And it's an extremely tough rock. It's basically sand that's been compressed and like welded together by extreme heat and pressure into a really hard, tough rock, which incidentally, if you go to Grossmorn Mountain, if you ever make it into Grossmorn National Park in Newfoundland, and I do recommend you go, Pay close attention, because as you walk that trail over the mountain, you actually watch the rocks change into quartzite. And so you have different rocks, which have all been planed off flat evenly with no differential erosion. It was all shaved off by water whose speed was so high, it did not care about the hardness of the rock or the toughness of the rock. So these quartzite boulders, they're all rounded. And when you take a close look at them, they actually have these strange rounded marks all over them. So these are 
hammer marks. Now, Vance Nelson and I were up in White Court, Alberta, which is about 600 to 650 kilometers away from this spot. And we actually experimented. Vance actually picked up some of the quartzite rocks. And all he did was he just picked them up and dropped them. And we got these marks exactly. So that's what's happened. These rocks have been rounded by moving water, but also hammered together. So the water was moving so fast that it was literally picking up these rocks, holding them in suspension, then together as it transported them across the continent, hammering them together. That's very so, much like a tumbler would do. Yes, except it was only doing the movement with water, right? Right, so, right. So and here's, here's where it gets really interesting because Michael Ord and Peter Klevberg actually did a paper on this where they, be, because there's, there's calculations, there are charts that are well-known, well-established for um, you know, water velocity and the size of the rock that the water velocity will pick up and carry, right? It's needed for you know, sediment experiments and erosion research and just all kinds of stuff. So the problem is, I mean, look at the size of this rock. They were off the charts. The charts did not go high enough. So rough estimate, the water would have had to have been flowing at least 75 miles an hour or 120 kilometers an hour minimum. Hmm. But don't forget, these rocks have been rounded. They've been whittled down smaller, so they started off bigger, much bigger. It would have to be for a prolonged period of time as well. It wouldn't be like this isn't a, this isn't a one week or a one day thing, but probably over the course of a few weeks to a month, you know, the, the flood could have lasted a year roughly or whatever the case yep. may be that would cause the rocks to round off as well, right? Okay, th thank you for bringing that up actually, um, because that's a very good point. Uh, I would contend, no, it wasn't even days. Uh, mm. in, fact, <laughs> in fact, because, uh, well, let me, let me back up for a second. I'm glad you brought that up because that's a, that's a significant point. So here's Cypress Hills. Here's where the rocks wound up. So if you stand on that mountain on top of the smallest rocks, because as the water is slowing down, the, the big rocks fall out of suspension in the water first. The smaller rocks, they're easier to carry, they fall out last. So if you stand on the smaller rocks and look back in the direction of the big rocks, you now know the direction from which those rocks came. Do you, do you follow me there? Does that I make do. sense? Very interesting. Okay, so Perfect sense. if you look back in that direction and start hiking until you find where those rocks came from, you find an outcrop of that specific kind of quartzite, and the only place you find it is 800 kilometers away in Idaho. Interesting. So, wow. so 800 kilometers away. So. It made that trip at 75 miles an hour minimum. We, we don't know what the maximum is. Minimum of 75 miles an hour. Uh, the rocks probably made that trip in under 10 hours, quick guess. So here's the catch. <laughs> There's also this really annoying 12,000 foot high Rocky Mountain range between point A and point B. So you have a choice. The rocks came from here, wound up here, so either you assume the Rocky Mountains weren't there, in which case you've still got a massive wall of water picking up rocks in Idaho, carrying them at highway speeds, minimum, <laughs> and depositing them in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Or you have all of that going up and over a major mountain range. Now, personally, I don't think the Rocky Mountain range was there. I don't think it had formed yet but I'm just, I'm, I'm pointing out the difficulties here. But if you have a wall of water, now remember, as I mentioned, I documented some of these, you know, way up here and way down here. So off the, off the map, 
you know, so as well. So this, this huge swath, this is a wall of water, thousands of feet above sea level moving inland at highway speeds. What is that? That is a global flood. There is no getting around it. <laughs> there is no getting around it. So Bill and I, Uh, brought this up in his debate with Ken Ham. He said, and by the way, if this great flood drained through the Grand Canyon, wouldn't there have been a Grand Canyon on every continent? How can we not have Grand Canyons everywhere if this water drained away in this extraordinary short amount of time, 4,000 years? On this, we can agree. He, he is absolutely right. If there has been a global flood, there will be Grand Canyons on every continent. Now, the catch here is Bill was suggesting that there was not. In fact, Grand Canyon is one of the smaller ones. And so let me, let me just give you some examples. Um, this is an aerial view of Hell's Canyon. Hell's Canyon is also in the US and is longer and deeper than Grand Canyon. By the way, I cover all, all of this in a lot more detail in the Complete Creation series, complete with these topographical maps and everything. So let me skip through all of that. This is, this is uh, Hell's Canyon from inside the canyon. And again, this is just another canyon that's actually bigger than Grand Canyon, and it's in North America. But that's just the North American ones. If you go down to Peru, Marignol Canyon is 10,000 feet deep, almost double the depth of Grand Canyon. And that's in Peru. Then you have others like Copper Canyon, which is in Mexico, which is also longer and deeper than Grand Canyon, but it's not just there. For example, this is in Greenland. So under the ice sheet of Greenland is this canyon, which they're pretty sure actually holds the record for the longest canyon on planet Earth. Now, it's nowhere near as deep as Grand Canyon, and it's only about, you know, 2,600 feet deep or so. But at 750 kilometers long, it is, they, they believe it is actually the longest canyon on the planet. You even have Grand Canyons in Antarctica. In fact, this canyon... What is below sea level is 11,500 feet deep. So basically twice the depth of Grand Canyon is underwater. And that's just what's underwater. The, the canyon continues above sea level. Now, the kicker, what's the largest mountain range in the planet? Come on, Al. Mount, Mount Everest. Mount Everest, correct. And actually, you know what I'm, what I'm going to do with that. <laughs> Um, because uh, this, this canyon actually circumscribes Mount Everest, but it cuts through Mount Everest as well. And it's so big and so deep that it's hard to show. But here it is right here. At its deepest point, it's 19,700 feet. Whoa. Will explain what a water gap is in a later show, but basically Grand Canyon is a water gap. And with present day processes, you'd have to have the mighty Colorado River defy physics and flow uphill for thousands of feet in order to start cutting Grand Canyon. And this Canyon too is a water gap. Now this is Mount Everest. It's the highest known point on planet Earth. Everything is downhill. So what are you going to do? Are you going to have water flowing uphill 19,700 feet to start cutting a canyon? That makes no sense at all. As most, um, but as most creationists believe, the mountains were actually rising up out of the floodwaters, as it states in Psalms. So the mountains are coming up through the water, the water is running off the continents and basically a mountain rises up and just gets in its road. So the water doesn't stop. It just cuts through the mountain. All right. 
Uh, we better go to a commercial break because we still have a viewer letter we need to, we got to address. For those of you who caught the live stream with Joseph Jordan and Guy Malone and were intrigued by the topic of aliens, UFOs, and how they fit within the biblical and creation science context, Ian put together a mini-series just on that topic. This four-part special report contains a deep dive into the shockingly common UFO phenomenon and even more shocking phenomenon of alleged alien abductions. You will walk through what both the Bible and scientists have to say about aliens and surprisingly, the theologians and even atheistic scientists agree on what these alleged aliens are. This miniseries is available on a two-disc set in either standard definition DVD or full high definition Blu-ray and is on sale now until November 15th. You can order your hard copies today on the store at ianjuby.org. Woohoo! Mail for me! Nathaniel wrote in on Facebook. Just scrolling and saw your name from an antagonist out of the blue. Do you have a video on sloths off the ark to SA? Nathaniel then provided the challenge from the antagonist. Quote, I'm still waiting for you to explain to me how the sloths got from Ararat to South America. Last time we talked about it, you said you'd get back to me. That was how many years ago now? I'm guessing that Ian Juby doesn't have a video on the topic. End quote. <laughs> Actually, I did deal with this topic in a past episode of Genesis Week, but I thought I would give a fresh and more detailed response because of Nathaniel's request. So the antagonist is asking completely the wrong question. This is like asking, which came first, the chicken or the egg? The correct answer is the rooster and the chicken both came into existence at the same time. They had to. Otherwise, we wouldn't have roosters, chickens, or eggs today. <laughs> so the antagonist seems to have it stuck in his head that this is some kind of challenge to the flood, Noah flood narrative, when in fact it is much, much more of a challenge to him and his presumably old earth beliefs. The correct question is, why do we only find sloths in South America today? Now, this is an excellent question for both camps, be it young earth believers or the advocates of the false man-made history of an old earth and evolution. Now, this map is by no means exhaustive. I frankly ran out of time adding hundreds and hundreds of dots where both fossil and extant sloths are found today, but I you know, got the important ones. Um, the middle of South America, uh, and especially along the Andes Mountains, um, there are dozens more fossils, fossil sloths finds alone that are not marked on this map. I will leave it to the viewers to research that much on their own. You see, the evolutionary camp would argue that sloths evolved in South America. And that's why they are isolated there. There are several problems with that theory. For example, fossil sloths have been found on multiple Caribbean islands. Look at this. So my first question to the antagonist is this. Um, how did those sloths get over there? Whatever answer you give me. You have just answered your original question about how sloths came from Mount Ararat after coming off of Noah's Ark. That right there settles the matter. You have just answered your own question that you mysteriously perceive as a problem for me, but not for you. <laughs> Strangely, you also appear to have failed to recognize the fatal problem for you when you flip that question on its head. Why do we not find sloths in other parts of the world. So this is really the identical question of 
why do we only find marsupials in Australia or why do we only find penguins in Antarctica? First, neither of those claims is true, but that hasn't slowed down the skeptics from challenging young earth creationists with their follow-up question. How did those animals get all the way from Mount Ararat to those continents after the flood? There's actually a number of processes which would have enabled global migration. And these processes have all been accepted as fact by the evolutionary camp themselves. For instance, it is well established through multiple lines of evidence that the oceans, sea level, was hundreds to thousands of feet lower than the present day levels, and for a long time period. Now, the evolutionists would say that period was at least 10,000 years. The creationists would say probably hundreds of years. So if you lowered the ocean levels by a mere 300 feet or 100 meters, you now have land bridges connecting every continent, including Antarctica, with the exception of Australia and New Guinea, which due to time constraints, I'll come back to in another show. I've only drawn in two of the land bridges. And please note, I did not draw in the land bridges connecting Europe to North America via Greenland. So let's go by the evolutionary assumptions and assume those land bridges created a path for sloths to travel from South America to well, wherever they wanted, really. And according to your time scale, they had 10,000 years to do so. If a couple of sloths start randomly heading north and sloths being notoriously slow, let's say they only traveled an average of 100 meters per day. I think that's reasonable, don't you? Well, in 1,000 years, those sloths could migrate 36,500 kilometers, or literally just shy of one lap around the entire planet. So in 10,000 years, those sloths, moving at 100 meters per day, could take more than nine laps around the entire planet. So using your numbers, your assumptions, we should find sloths all over the planet. Why do we not find sloths on every single continent? Is it because they wouldn't or couldn't go to the Arctic regions because it was cold? Well, apparently you are unaware that fossil sloths, which are superior to modern sloths in both size and diversity, have been uncovered in Northern Yukon and Alaska. And notice the subtle, completely unfounded assumption that these sloths came from South America. I am just as justified to call upon those fossils and say, see, there's your evidence of sloth migration from the Middle East across the Bering Strait as they made their way down to South America, becoming extinct everywhere else on the planet. There has also been multiple apparent sloth fossil tooth fossils found in Eocene deposits on Seymour Island in West Antarctica. That island borders on the Antarctic Circle. And don't get me started on Siberia, where we find buried in the permafrost. Woolly mammoths, horses, camels, rhinoceros, lion, leopard, bear, tiger, reindeer, giant beaver, musk sheep, musk ox, donkey, and a whack of other animals that nobody is claiming lived in Arctic conditions. In fact, Mike Gord pointed out a profound comparison. It was extremely difficult to describe the incredible diversity of mammals we find buried in the permafrost of Siberia, well above the modern day Arctic Circle. The diversity is so vast that multiple researchers have commented that the only similar diversity of mammals found today is on the Serengeti of East Africa. Even the polar regions weren't the Arctic conditions that we see today. And on that note, <laughs> please notice that the polar regions were dramatically warmer in the past. So the earth has undergone extreme cooling to the point where trees, which did grow in the Arctic at rates far exceeding temperate climates today, 
They can't even grow in our polar regions anymore. So question, if we are seeing global warming, is it because of man? Or is the Earth finally recovering back to what was actually normal global warm temperatures? Hmm? But coming back to the sloths, let's compare the problem for the old Earth model with the similar challenge to the young Earth model presented by our skeptic. By comparison, for sloths to travel the roughly 21,000 kilometers from Mount Ararat across the Beringia land bridge down to South America in, say, uh, 200 years. The sloths do have to pick up the pace a little. <laughs> they would have to travel closer to 300 meters per day. I think that's quite feasible, don't you? If they took the Greenland ice bridge, that shaves off some 5,000 kilometers from the trip. All right, thank you for writing in, Nathaniel. I have to call that a wrap. Because the live recordings are going to be made on an as-needed basis, we're going to try to post the schedules for upcoming live streams on social media and on the genesisweek.com website. So you can join us live, participate in the chats, and maybe get your questions or comments featured on the show. So check out our social media pages for upcoming live streams. Depending on how many shows we get out of one live stream, we might have the live stream like a couple of times a month per so or so. Uh, we need to keep at current events as well because Genesis Week is all about current events. So join us live if you can. I will leave you with those words of our creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. We'll see you on the flip side. You can send your comments, questions, hate mail, and letter bombs to us in a number of ways. You can email comments at genesisweek.com, or you can tweet at Genesis Week, or leave a comment on CORE's Facebook page at CORE Ottawa, or leave a comment on the appropriate show available on either the Rumble channel, rumble.com slash user slash Ian Juby, or on the YouTube channel, which you can easily find by going to wazulu.com, that's Ian. And that'll take you straight to the YouTube channel. But just remember, these shows are now recorded live, so you'll want to search out the show under the Live tab. We need your support to keep this program on the air. So please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation via PayPal online at ianjuby.org slash donations. Or you can mail a check written out to CORE. Canada North, Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K2P4. And thank you for your support.